Welcome to this Authors at Google event. Uh, today we're pleased to introduce Marco Iacoboni, uh, author of the book Mirroring People, The New Science of How We Connect with Others. Marco is soon to be professor uh, of psychiatry and behavioral, biobehavioral sciences at the Gethin School of Medicine in UCLA, specializing in neuroscience and the neural basis of social behavior. His groundbreaking research into mirror neurons also known as Smart Cells, has been covered in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he's also appeared on Good Morning America, The Early Show, and Morning Edition. So he sounds a bit like a morning person. I hope this isn't too late for you. Um, but uh, please join me in welcoming Marco to this event. Thank you. I'm actually not so much of a morning person. <laughs> and it's actually the very first time that I give a talk in a room in which there is a tennis table. And I'm tempted to, why am I giving this talk and not playing tennis table? Um, well, so what I want to do today is let me give you a little overview of uh, the kind of things I want to discuss. Um, it's, the first thing I want to do is really to try to talk about the discovery of mirror neurons um, and how these we actually grasp this idea that there are some, some cells that do the kinds of things that mirror neurons do. Uh, it's really something that forced us to completely change the way we think about the brain. And it, there's plenty of stories in the media about how the, this discovery was made. All those stories are false. And uh, it's interesting, actually, to talk about this, because it, it's gonna, I think it's important to figure out how people uh, look at things and phenomena, and scientists, which are supposed to be the ones that make discovery, often have uh, strong assumptions, and those assumptions make them blind about the phenomena they're trying to study. So it's really um, a good uh, example now we have to often be more open-minded than we uh, tend to think. Then what I want to do is to talk about uh, mirror neurons and imitation. That was uh, the kind of work that I started doing uh, in the late 90s in my lab at UCLA. And um, there was a good reason to do that. First of all, the properties of these cells are such that they seem to be really designed for imitation. But the other thing is that imitation is such a powerful way of communicating between people. Uh, the social psychologist Up Dixterus from Holland says imitation is a social glue. Uh, when people start imitating each other, they start liking each other much more. And so I think it's important to study imitation because, and its neural basis because it's a really powerful way in which people connect with each other. Then I want to talk about how mirror neurons can really get into the minds of others. This was a classical problem in philosophy of minds called the problem of other minds, and it was uh, considered almost unsolvable. While it seems that evolution has devised a very simple mechanism to really get in a very in its automatic, almost effortless way into the minds of others, what are they inten their intentions when they do certain actions. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about a study that's been often covered by the media, the Tea Party experiment that we did in uh, my lab to address experimentally this issue on how mirror neurons can uh, let us understand the intentions of others. And then, of course, if you have these cells that let you recognize the actions of others and even the deeper mental states associated with those actions like the intention, then the question is, can we actually even get into the emotions of other people? Can we feel what other people feel? And the argument I'm going to make is that, in fact, I think that this discovery tells us that evolution has made us wired for empathy. Whoops. really wired for empathy. And this, it's gonna re, this, I think it's a major revision of long-standing beliefs. The idea is that our biology makes us for self-preservation, makes us individualist, and we become social animals with our higher order ideas. I think it's the, exactly the opposite. Our biology and evolution made us really uh, wired for empathy. Uh, we, were select, we selected our systems in our brain that make us social animals. 
And with this, I want to get also into the issue of the intimacy of self and other. Uh, that's my slogan. Especially in the Western society, we are so individualist that we think that self and other are really detached entities. In other societies, in other cultures, especially in Eastern cultures, uh, there is much more um, intimacy between self and other. And I think that these cells really remind us that, in fact, the other is much closer to us than we think. Uh, and in fact, what I'm going to argue to is that mirror neurons are not just about coding the actions of others, but even creating a sense of self. And then I'm going to say a few words about what I call broken mirrors, the fact that if this system doesn't work at its full capacity, you may have problem in social behavior. And so what can you do with that? Okay, first of all, uh, we, have, uh, we had some hypothesis about uh, mirror neurons and uh, um, disorder of social behavior. And now our work has even inspired some forms of interventions in patients that have uh, social uh, disorders. And the last thing I want to say is something about neuroscience and society. I think that this work and the fact that, you know, one of the things I decided to write this book is because it's for us, it's very easy to talk to fellow neuroscientists in a jargon-laden kind of language and communicate ideas only at this level. But this kind of discovery really tells us something profound about us. And I think that the fact that all this stuff so far has worked at an implicit level, not explicitly, because these all these you know these neurons are really uh, modern neurons. So uh, we are almost not even aware that this stuff is our, in our brain. The moment we realize that we have this system in our brain, it really changes the way we look at it uh, at each other and at our society. And to me, this is going to really create. It could potentially create an impact such that our society can be more empathic just because we are aware of the way biology has shaped us as uh, our brain. All right, I'm a neuroscientist, so I get to show you some brain pictures. And this is a uh, drawing of a primate brain. And what you can see here is that all the regions in color are brain regions that in some way have cells that are relevant to motor behavior, to actions. And while uh, a group of neuroscientists from Parma were studying cells that are located in this little area here, area 5 and these cells are really important for grasping, they found these uh, mirroring properties of these cells. A little digression. A lot of people think I'm from Parma because I am Italian and I work on mirror neurons, and it's almost natural to think that. And I'm, in fact, from the eternal city, from Rome, and I actually met the physiologist from Parma only when I was already in LA. And I, I met Ritzolati, in fact, in Prague. That tells you, you know, our world is small and mobile. Well, so what they were studying grasping because, of course, grasping is such a fundamental uh, action. We kind of take it for granted. We don't even pay attention to it, but we grasp things all, all the time. Of course, I'm grasping this little gadget here, and it helps me for uh, my talk, but you can't get out of your house without grasping the doorknob. Grasping is really an essential action that we uh, make several times a day, and it's really essential for, for us to actually manipulate our environment. So they were looking into the uh, uh, aspects of the neural mechanisms for grasping, and they were studying a variety of cells that had these uh, properties, motor properties. Every time the monkey would uh, grasp something, the cell would fire. That makes sense, because that's what you'd expect in these regions. And then at some point, they realized that there was another phenomenon. It was really something that they did not expect. That is, some of these cells that fire when the monkey grasps uh, an object. Let me uh, walk you through this uh, graph. This is called raster, and each line represents a trial, and each one of these little marks represents an action potential when the cell fires. And so you have a variety of trials in which the cell, every time the monkey grasps, the cell fires strongly. Down below, there is this called histogram, and it represents the firing rate change of the cell. So every time the, mon the monkey grasps, this fire, the, the cell changes the fire rate about 10 times. So it's a very robust change in fire rate in this cell. So clearly this cell discharges every time the monkey makes an action. So far, so good. We do expect that. But then they also found that they, the same cell, and there is about 20% of these cells in this brain area called F5, also fire when the monkey is completely still and just watches somebody else making the same action. 
there are, many, there are many stories on how this thing was discovered. There are at least two favorite stories in the media. One is that uh, Leo Fogassi, one of the physiologists, grasped the peanut. It was the discharge of the cell, and the physiologist had an immediate realization of this phenomenon. Another one, which is even, I think, uh, uh, nicer, it's the story of Bitterger Lazy leaving the lab. It's a summer day, it's very hot. He goes out of the lab and he grabs a very nice Italian ice cream. And he's still working on the ice cream when he gets back to the lab. And the monkey is sitting on the chair doing nothing. And there is an, an electrode implanted in the monkey's brain. And every time Vittorio licks the ice cream, the cell fires. And Vittorio has this immediate realization that there are mirror neurons in the brain. It didn't work that way. It turns out that because, the, and, you know, these physiologists are the most open-minded scientists I, I know of. But still, they had these assumptions that in a motor area, you don't have a response to just the side of somebody else's action. And so when I asked them, when I started writing a book, I, I asked them, uh, so uh, which one of these stories is true? Because I read di different accounts in the media. And they told me, you know, Marco, none of these stories is, are true. These are all ur urban legends. Uh, there is nothing, I don't know where, where these stories come from, but one thing we, real at some point, we had this progressive realization and something really unexpected was going on. At some point, we really grasped this idea. We became aware that these cells fire to the actions of others. And then we started doing a variety of control studies to, to really make sure that this was the case, because we were incredulous. We didn't believe it ourselves. And after we really realized that this was the phenomenon, we thought, well, let's go back to our lab notes and let's figure out when was the first time we reported something like that. And it turns out that they went back and back and back, and the only thing they found were really vague notes like complex visual motor cells, uh, complex responses of this cell. And they have this idea that, in fact, they were seeing this, this phenomenon, but were not, they were not aware. And they, they were so, this, the assumptions they made about this brain region were such that they were blind to a phenomenon that was under the nose. OK, so what are the properties of these cells? Well, I think that, you know, one thing I, I want to emphasize is that they're really specialized for actions. Um, sometime, in the media, I think that you know, there's all a little bit too much of a hype about these cells. I mean, the, like, they do everything. First of all, they respond to actions of other people when it comes to just the visual properties. They do not respond to any kind of stimulus. If, I see, if the monkey sees an object in front of her, mirror neurons will not fire. So they're really specialized for actions of others. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that even though mirror cells are, I mean, the term mirror has been really good in terms of capturing uh, um, the imagination of people, it really captures only one component of the, the responses of these cells. Of course, mirroring is a, a fundamental aspect of what, what these cells do, but they do not fire always for the same action. A, a third of these cells are called strictly congruent mirror neurons, and they fire exactly for the same action, so say, tearing paper or holding something. But two-thirds of the cells, we call them broadly congruent mirror neurons, because they fire for actions from a motor and a visual standpoint that are complementary, or they can achieve the same goal. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. When we interact, it's not just about mirroring each other. If, I'm, if I see my baby crying, I don't want to just cry. I want to do something to console the baby. And so interactions are often made of actions that are complementary, not necessarily mirroring. They also fire for hidden action. Often we see people doing certain things, and then um, they disappear because they are covered. Can we figure out what they are doing? It turns out that there are studies that show that, in fact, these cells don't, do not need to see the whole action in order to fire. Uh, there was a study done with the, you know, the monkey was, was seeing that there was an object, a graspable object on the screen, uh, on the desk, and then a screen would cover uh, the side of the object, and the monkey would see somebody reaching behind the screen. Even though the grasping action wasn't observed, those cells would fire. The paper that reported this finding was entitled, I know what you're doing. And I think it's also very important because often we don't have a complete information about the actions of others, but we can extrapolate from the information that we have. And it seems that these cells, at a single cell level, can actually do the whole job. They also respond to action sound. When we uh, make actions, often we also have sounds associated with those actions, like breaking a peanut, tearing paper, footsteps in the hallway. 
And uh, it turns out that some of these cells respond to just the sound of an action without seeing the action itself. And so if you think about it, they fire when the monkey makes the action, when the monkey sees somebody else making it, to actions that are partially hidden, to the sound of an action. So they have a fairly abstract coding of the actions of others. And I think that's also very important because if you really want to get into understanding the mental states of other people, you got to be able to have this abstract coding of actions of other people. And because we have this, you know, we may disclaim that these cells may be very important for understanding also the emotions of others, I want to remind you that these cells have been discovered not just for hand actions, but also for uh, mouth actions. And uh, of course, emotions are often conveyed uh, with our face. And the studies that have been done uh, have been uh, um, led by this guy, oops, Pier Francesco Ferrari. He's a, he, da, he, did, he did his, his PhD with uh, an enetologist, and he studied monkey behavior. And then he did a postdoc with Rizzolatti doing single cell neurophysiology. And you can tell that he studied monkey behavior for a while, because he's really good at doing these uh, uh, <laughs> facial gestures. This is called lip smacking, and it is a facial gesture that has a positive valence in, uh, uh, in, in monkey behavior. So he studied both ingestive gestures, like you know, uh, biting a banana or drinking juice from a syringe. This is the way juice is delivered to the monkey in the lab. So um, it's, for them, it's a common action, and it's a very relevant one. And also these communicative actions. And there are mirror neurons for all these kinds of actions. And so, of course, the existence of these cells uh, make us think that when we see other people expressing uh, their emotions through their face, we can actually simulate that with our own mirror cells in our own brain. So of course, the properties of these cells were really tailored for imitation. And so uh, when about 12 years ago, we started thinking, let's do a project, a collaborative project, in which you know, people from LA doing brain imaging like me, and uh, neurophysiologists from Parma and other labs all over the world, in parallel, we were studying uh, the mirror neuron system in both monkeys and humans. We thought, well, what can we do in terms of functional brain imaging in humans? And I thought, well, imitation seems to be um, a fundamental thing that happens in human behavior, and it seems really a nice task that we can use in our brain scanners. And one of the reasons why I'm really interested in imitation is because it seems that humans are really good at imitating very early on. And imitation, it's a very nice way of bypassing trial and error learning. This is the work of Andy Meltzoff, and he demonstrated that even newborns can imitate uh, at least some very simple facial expression. The earliest, uh, the, the youngest baby that he studied was 41 minutes old. And uh, he was able to um, demonstrate that there is this at least rudimentary capacity to imitate facial expressions. He also did something amazing, at least for a scientist. He managed to, pass, to publish a paper in Science, which is a highly prestigious journal, scientific journal, with a picture of himself sticking his tongue out. <laughs> so we thought, well, let's use some imitation tasks to, to test whether or not there are human areas with uh, um, cells that with, with a behavior that suggests that uh, there are cells with, uh, with mirroring properties in those areas. Remember, in the human brain, we can't really achieve the resolution of individual cells. Actually, we can in some cases, but, but uh, I'm not going to talk, talk about that right now. And so we thought, well, how do we go about how, how can we go from the single cell in the monkey to brain imaging in humans? And we devised a relatively simple prediction. We started again from the original discovery and the original observation. And you can see there is a stronger response of the cell when the monkey does the action compared to when the monkey just sees the action. And we uh, predicted that uh, human brain areas should have something, uh, some, something similar in terms of their uh, pattern of activity. So kind of a bold response is the fm fMRI signal that we used to you know, measure activity in brain regions, a given response for a motor task, a little bit less for an, act for an action observation task. But then when it comes to imitation, you do and see at the same time. And so we predicted an increased signal, and we pre predicted that mirror neuron areas should have this kind of profile of activity when it comes to imitating others, uh, doing a, a motor task, or just observing actions of others. And we used a very simple paradigm, just lifting fingers and some control conditions. And we found two regions in the human brain that had exactly this profile. 
And these two regions were, first of all, anatomically homologous to the areas of the monkey brain in which mirror neurons were discovered. And so that was nicely reassuring. But the other thing was that we found that one region in the frontal lobe overlapped with a classical language area. It's called Broca's area because the, there was a French neurologist in the 19th century that was the first one that described a patient with a disorder of language after a brain lesion, and the lesion was located right here, and it, that's why this, this area is called Broca's area. Now, because we found these properties in Broca's area, in a way, our work kind of supported, there was a, a hypothesis, an evolutionary hypothesis, that in fact these cells may be precursors of neural systems for language. Because there is a whole hypothesis about communication that initially started as gestural communication. Italians are still doing it. It turns out everybody's doing it. It turns out if you talk over the phone to, to friends, even though they can't see you, 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 you gesture. And uh, so there are linguists that in fact say that words and gestures are part of just one system, and that system is language. But of course, when you do brain imaging and you get activation in a language area, there's also this, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword, because in principle, it could be that what happens, you have this kind of covert verbalization of the task that your subjects are doing, and that's why you see activity in Broca's area. So we thought, let's test it. We have another tool now in coin neuroscience, which is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. That's what stands for TMS. And the way it works is that we have a copper coil, which is encased in plastic, and that we can place on the head of subjects. We can deliver an electric uh, pulse over through the coil. And if you do it uh, quickly enough, you induce a magnetic field, a tiny one. That magnetic field goes through the skull and reaches the surface of the brain. And by doing so, it injects electricity in the, in the brain. And so we basically inject noise in the brain tissue underneath the coil. We can induce some kind of a transient lesion in the region of the brain that is underneath the coil. And so we did a study in which we looked at, can we interfere Broca's area, this language area? And if when we do that, can we actually detect a disorder of imitation? And we did a study in which the subject were doing a computer task in which they were supposed to imitate a variety of actions. And every time we were interfering with activity in Broca's area, there was a, a reduction in performance in, uh, uh, in the task. And so this suggested that, in fact, Broca's area is essential to imitation. And so the fact that both imitation and language coexist in the same brain area it really supports this hypothesis that our language ability comes from gestural communication initially, and then it evolved into the language that we know now. Yeah, I call this from brain mapping to brain zapping. So right now, what we know right now, and again, our ideas are changing dramatically and quickly. We are acquiring a lot of new information on this system. And in fact, this whole idea can be may be revised very soon. But let me give you what is you know, the current model. There are two major areas in the human brain, the one in red, that contain mirror neurons that have mirroring properties. One is in the frontal lobe and overlaps, at least in part, with Broca's area. And the other one is in the, in the parietal lobe, which is a part of the brain that's really important for um, putting together perception and action. And these two mirror neuron areas seem to have a visual input that comes from a region that we call posterior STS. And it is an area that contains only visual neurons, so they're not mirror neurons. But they seem to respond visually to the same kind of things that drive the response of mirror cells, that is complex actions from other people. So this is the, the, the model that we have at right now, but again, things might change uh, quickly. Okay, what do we do with this system? We can immediately recognize the actions of others. Why? Because we use the same machinery in our own brain that we use when we make those actions. So there is, there is no need for an infer a complex and uh, a time-consuming inferential process. He's doing that thing, and so he's grasping. But our actions are often associated, or I would say always associated with some intentions. So can we actually use this same machinery to understand the intentions of other, other people rather than their, just their actions? 
And uh, in order to, and there are two main camps in the literature about mind reading. One that says, well, in order to understand the minds of others, we use pretty much the same approach that scientists use when they study natural phenomena. They make some observation, they come up with some theories, and then they kind of validate their model. So it's a very inferential and uh, uh, complex process. The other field says, no, the way we do it is with a very automatic simulation of the, the actions of others. We pretend to be in others' shoes by using a simulative kind of uh, process. And mirror neurons seem to be really ideally um, designed for that. The way I like to introduce this problem is by introducing these two characters, Professor Snape and Harry Potter. I was reading the fifth book of the saga, um, and it's, at that point I really didn't like Snake, Snape, but uh, when, after I read this uh, exchange between Snape and Potter, I thought, well, actually, Snape is not that bad. And now, of course, I changed my mind entirely about him. So the story here is that Voldemort is trying to get into the mind of Harry Potter. And uh, what Snape is supposed to do is to teach Harry Potter occlumency, such that he prevents Voldemort to get into his own mind. And so Snape says, the Dark Lord is highly skilled at extracting feelings and memories from another person's mind. And what Harry responds is, uh, he can read minds. And here, what I really like about Snape, he, re he replies, you have no subtlety, Potter. Only muggles talk of mind reading. The mind is not a book. And that's exactly my point, that for, we interact with people con continuously. Uh, we have transactions with other humans all the time. We see their uh, other fe fellow humans interacting with us and doing their own actions continuously. Why do we have to make inferential processes and mechanisms every time we see somebody doing something? Why can't we use a much simpler mechanism that is the same machinery we use to achieve our own intention is activated when we see somebody else uh, making those actions and achieving those intentions. But of course the question is how do you actually uh, track uh, this problem from an experimental standpoint? And so we came up with, a, with, a, with an idea, um, some kind of a, this, you know, media has been dubbed the Tea Party experiment. So the idea is the following. The same action is not associated with the same, uh, the same action can be mapped on two different intentions. I'll give you a little uh, demonstration. I can grasp this because I want to drink or later on because I want to clean up the, uh, the desk of the speaker. So the same grasping action is associated with two different intentions. And the context in which the action occurs often gives us a clue about the intention of the actor. And so we thought, let's design an experiment in which subjects are watching different kinds of grasping action embedded in two different contexts. One context is uh, you see a neatly organized scene with uh, cookies, a teapot, there is a, a cup. These are, these are all little videos. And we had uh, a little Italian signature here. This is a piece of Nutella. And then the same grasping action embedded in a different kind of context. Now, this is a, a context in which there are cookie crumbs, a uh, dirty napkin, uh, and uh, here um, there's no milk anymore, so, and the cup is empty. It suggests that somebody already had some kind of a tea party, and now it's grasping the cup to put it in the dishwasher. Of course, humans tend to grasp things when they drink in this way, this is called precision grip, and tend to grasp things when they clean up in, in this way, which is called whole body, uh, whole end preemption, uh, the body of the cup. So we thought we don't want to deal with this and we can counterbalance the uh, uh, grasping actions that were uh, whole hand preemption and precision grip in both contexts. Now, the prediction is relatively simple when you do it, such an experimental design. Um, if the areas with mirror neurons are only concerned with the action, they should be activated similarly for both situations, for both grasping action in a, in a context that suggests drinking and grasping action in a context that suggests cleaning up. But if they actually code the intention associated with the action, they should have differential activity. And ideally, you want to see more activity for uh, drinking, because drinking is a much more primary intention than cleaning up, especially if you're, if you're subject or college students. And what we found was, in fact, that one of the classical mirror neuron areas in the frontal lobe activates, of course, for both situations, but with a higher activity for the uh, drinking context. And this work really reminds me of the, uh, uh, a quote of a French phenomenologist, Maurice Bernal-Ponty, 
from his uh, most famous book, Phenomen Phenomenology of Perception, it is if, if the other person's intentions inhabited my body and mine his. Here we use a very simple mechanism to get into the minds of others. Understanding the minds of others is no longer a problem. Evolution has devised a very simple approach to get into the mental states of others. But then we can actually, the, the question was, OK, we, we know that these cells recognize actions of others. We have evidence that they seem to recognize the intentions of others. Can they help us understand the emotions of others? Can they help us feeling what other people feel? There's plenty of authors that over the centuries have actually described this phenomenon. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes. One is from Wittgenstein. We see emotions. We do not see facial contortions and make the inference that is feeling joy, grief, boredom. We describe a face immediately as sad, radiant, bored, even when we are unable to give any other description of the feature. So this is a nice and powerful description of the automatic way in which we see the emotions from the face uh, of others. And all the way back from Adam Smith, um, when we see a stroke aimed and just ready to fall upon the leg or arm of another person, we naturally shrink and draw back our leg or our own arm. And when, we, when it does fall, we feel it in some measure and are hurt by it as well as the sufferer. Again, this is a nice description of the automatic tendency that we have to empathize with others. But the question from the standpoint of neuroscience is that how does that work? Because after all, the areas that contain mirror neurons are not the classical emotional brain centers. So as a scientist, I had to kind of figure out how these two systems would work with each other. And you know, a nice way of uh, thinking about it is also thinking that imitation is linked strongly, strongly with, uh, with empathy. There's a phenomenon called the chameleon effect. When humans uh, interact socially, they tend to imitate each other all the time. I'll give you a brief uh, visuals of this. Uh, there is, uh, is a, uh, President Carter giving a speech while uh, he was president. And this is the chief of his staff. And later on during the talk, we have this tendency to imitate each other automatically. And it turns out there are differences. Some people tend to be more chameleons than others. And there, there are studies that show that the more you tend to, to imitate others, the more you tend to empathize with others. There's a very nice correlation. And so this is another piece of evidence that tells me that there is a nice connection between mirror neuron areas that are important for imitation and emotional brain centers. And so what I did was to look into the anatomy. And I, like the question was, we see a face like this one. What happens in our brain? We have these mirror cells for facial expression that would activate. And in this case, what they would do is to simulate the facial expression. And then through a system uh, that uh, con includes the insula, which is a region that connects these mirror neuron areas and the emotional brain areas, the signals from mirror neurons go all the way to the emotional brain centers. And then you feel the emotions in others. And we did some imaging experiments that actually demonstrated that these three major centers really work together and communicate with each other. Again, this work reminds me of another quote from Merleau-Ponty. I live in the facial expression of the other as I feel him living in mine. Every time we interact and we see facial expressions in our people, we have the tendency to also uh, simulate those expressions in our own brain. Then we, okay, we thought, OK, let's use this concept that there are this, this large system in the brain that contains mirror neurons, start from mirror neurons, but also includes emotional brain centers that make us um, empathic with other people. Can we use this system as some kind of a biomarker of society? I mean, we had evidence from social psychology studies that the more you imitate, the more you are a chameleon, the more you tend to empathize. Could it be that these brain regions actually give us a nice uh, quantitative measure of the tendency to empathize of other people? So we're doing a study. This is a longitudinal study in which we get kids before they get uh, into uh, puberty. And we follow them up for several years. And we're doing a variety of different things. And one thing we do is to put them in the scanner and ask them to observe or imitate facial expressions, emotional facial expression. And uh, then we can measure their brain activity. But we can also correlate the activity in the brain of these kids with their 
with some uh, measures of social competence. We use two. One is called interpersonal competence and one is called empathic uh, concern. We're using uh, these kinds of faces so that eventually when we get more data, we can even look at the effects of uh, gender, or race, and so on. And what we found, and this is a study we just published this year, in fact, in these three major areas, in mirror neuron areas, uh, right here, in the um, amygdala and in the insula, the activity, while the kids are either imitating or observing facial expression, correlates with these uh, measures of social competence. This one in particular is called interpersonal competence, and it tells us how popular is the kid, how many friends does the kid have, how many play dates he gets every week. And there's a really robust correlation between the activity in these brain areas and the, uh, comp the social competence of these kids. So we call this system a biomarker of society because the activity on this system seems to correlate very well with social behavior. And this tells us that maybe this, this concept that self and other, that these such detached entities should be revised. So can we actually even make the claim that these cells are not just about understanding others, but even creating a sense of self? Well, there is again some evidence in the developmental psychology that tells us that, that in fact these cells can, may be involved in uh, creating a sense of self. There are studies that show that uh, toddlers um, that are able to self-recognize uh, also tend to imitate others more. What do I mean with self-recognize? Well, there is a test, a very simple test, that can be done even in animals. It, calls, it is called the mirror test. Yeah, there are many mirrors in this story. And the idea is that um, it's been done initially in chimps, and the idea is that you know, the, the chimp first looks at uh, uh, his own or her own face uh, over, on a mirror, and then uh, gets anesthetized or while he's sleeping, the scientist puts a mark on the forehead of the chimp. When the chimp wakes up and looks at the mirror, if he has the awareness that that face is, is his own face or her own face, he's going to be surprised because the mark wasn't there. So how come I have a mark here? So you can do this same experiment with uh, uh, children, and generally you do that you know, when they're sleeping, when uh, they're sleeping you, you put a mark on their forehead. It turns out that uh, children look in mirrors very early on in life, even the, in the first year of life, they can spend hours in front of a mirror, but they have no clue that what they see in the mirror is their own face. Because if you do this uh, a mirror test, they have no evidence of mark-directed behavior. They don't look at the mark, they don't touch it, and so on. But toward the second year of life, uh, children achieve this capacity to recognize that that face reflected by the mirror is my own face. And now when they actually see the mark, have this mark-directed behavior, they touch the mark, they are puzzled, why do I have this thing? So at some point, they achieve this capacity to recognize their own face. And when they do that, they tend to imitate others more. This tells me that the concept of self and the concept of mapping self onto others really go together. And so my slogan is that while interact with other people, we find ourselves. So we did a couple of experiments to try to uh, provide some evidence that, in fact, these areas in the human brain that, uh, in which we think there are mirror neurons are also associated with self-recognition. Oh, yeah, and there is a nice quote here that I like to, to say, the minds of men are mirrors of one another. And this, again, gives us an idea of the intimacy between self and other. So the experiment we did was we were morphing uh, the faces of our own subject with the faces of their best friend. So we're doing different kinds of morphs, so um, with the 100% you know, self, 80% self, and so on. And the task of the subject was to recognize if there was more self or more other in, the, in these morphs. And subjects are pretty good at doing this task. Uh, they find these two uh, kinds of morphs a bit challenging, but they tend to be good at the task. We also found that while they were doing the task, the more they were dealing with morphs with the increased self, the higher was the activity in our mirror neuron areas, both in the frontal and in the parietal. So this was nice evidence that suggested that mirror neurons are not just about actions of others or intentions of others or mental states of others, but they also seem to uh, help us making a, a building a sense of self. 
And then we did a TMS study in which we actually interfered with the activity in the parietal region with uh, uh, mirror neurons. And the prediction was relatively simple. If these regions are really important for self-recognition, when you TMS this region and you create a virtual lesion in this region, then you should have a decreased performance in self-recognition. And that's what we found. So that was a nice causal link between this mirror neuron area and uh, the ability to self-recognize. And the other thing that we've been uh, talking about for a while, and now we're really doing a series of study, is the idea that uh, there, if this system doesn't work at its full capacity, you may have disorders of social behavior. Um, so uh, I've been saying for years, the while there may be broken mirrors in autism. And we did a study a couple of years ago that demonstrated not only that, in fact, this is the case. These were two groups, typically developing kids and uh, kids uh, with autism. And they were doing a task of imitating and uh, observing facial emotional expression. And you can see that there is a clear um, difference in the pattern of activity of these two groups. The uh, kids with autism no, do not activate at all these inferior frontal regions that contain mirror neuron areas, uh, and whereas the typically developing kids activate these regions quite a bit. And when you do a direct comparison, you see that the difference is right there in these mirror neuron areas in which uh, typically developing kids have higher activity and patients with autism have reduced activity. But even more importantly, when we correlated the severity of the disease in these patients with the activity in these regions, we found that there was a strong correlation such that the more severe is the disorder, the more reduced is the activity in these areas. So again, this is another evidence that this system is a biomarker, not only of society, but even of disease when you have a social disorder. Now, what is exciting about this line of research is that there are people who work with patients with autism that have picked up this concept. And what they are doing now is to use social inter um, I mean interventions in which they use imitation as a form of treatment. So what these therapists do is rather than telling the children, well, do what I do, which is really not the way people imitate each other automatically in social interaction, they start working with the children, first of all, imitating what the, what, what the children are doing. And then they try to lead the child toward uh, you know, some practices that should increase their ability to imitate and to empathize. And this work is especially led by um, Sally Rogers at uh, UC Davis in the, in the Mind Institute. And she was telling me a few months ago that they have some preliminary data that suggests that this intervention seems to be extremely powerful and that you have uh, improvement in a variety of domains, even in language in these children. And the other cool thing about these interventions is that they're simple. You can teach the parents to do those interventions, even at home. So that's a very exciting uh, implication. Generally, you know, when you go from basic neuroscience, in order to apply this concept to a uh, clinical application, it takes a long time. Here, in the, in the span of maybe 10 years, we were able to go from the science in the lab to some applications. All right, I want to make just a few remarks to wrap up this um, um, talk. I think that one thing that we have learned with this uh, neuroscience discovery is that we have a system in our brain that was selected to facilitate social interactions. That's why we are so good at being social, because we, have, uh, we are wired for, to, to socialize. And this very same system solves what in philosophy of mind has been called the problem of other minds. How can I understand the minds of others if I, can have, if I have access only to my own mind? Turns out, again, evolution has devised this very simple mechanism that allows us, without any magic, to get into the mental states of others. And again, I think that this is a major revision of long-standing beliefs. The classical idea is that our biology makes us individualists, and we become social with higher-order ideas. Um, this discovery and this neuroscience work really tell us that we are really wired for being social. And maybe what happens is exactly the opposite. What divides us are our religious and political beliefs. And these themes are themes that often recur in existentialism. And that's why I like to call this kind of neuroscience existential neuroscience. Um, I think existentialists get a, often a bad press. Often people associate that term with dread and despair. But there are plenty of themes in existential philosophy that really talk about involvement and care, commit to other people. And I think these cells are really about this. 
And it, really, it also tells us something about the role of neuroscience in our society. We tend to be, and this is something I, you know, I've been trying to tell my, also my colleagues for a while now, we tend to be trapped in our ivory tower. It's very easy to fall back in our jargon and just do our own practices and be totally insulated from our society. But it turns out that some discoveries really tell us something about the human condition. And what we want to do in this case is really try to convey this message out. Why? Because all these uh, mechanisms in our brain are all implicit. We, we've been using them for centuries, but we weren't aware of those, uh, of those mechanisms. But now that we know that this is what's going on in our brain, and this tells us something about us, reaching the, the explicit level, it really can be even change and shape our society because societies are built not on implicit uh, a transaction between nuance but on explicit discourse. And I'd like to close here and I'll be happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much. And we actually have a mic set up for questions, so I will start it around. So often when you're trying to physically mirror someone, when they move their right arm, you move your left arm. I was wondering if that also happens in the mirror neurons in the brain. Great question. Uh, actually, we did a, a study on that. It's true. And if you, you can do it in the experiment. If you go in a classroom of preschoolers, you are in front of the, uh, the kids, and you tell them, do what I do. And you raise your right hand without saying anything. They raise the left hand, everybody. But if you go in a class of junior high, and you say, do what I do, and you raise your right hand, often you see it raising also the right hand, especially when you're not doing really fast mirroring. Uh, so there is this tendency very early on in life to imitate in this mirror fashion. And so we actually compare this mirror imitation with the more anatomically um, correct imitation, and we found that these mirror neuron areas activate four times more for the mirror imitation. Our subjects were doing exactly the same action, just lifting a finger, and they were imitating either a left hand so mirror or a right hand anatomical and the same action in response to a left hand so a mirror form of imitation activates the system four times more so was the was the difference in age due to a change in what the mirror neurons were doing or due to executive function over executive time? function the idea i mean we don't have you know that direct evidence for that but the, the most probable explanation is that executive functions can override this tendency to imitate in the mirror way thank you um my second question is, do you, do you see, it's sort of back to your um, social aptitude or empathy versus the activation of the brain. Do you see that across, I guess, people without autism, but with perhaps other social disorders? We don't have any uh, data on that, but for instance, one thing that we want to do is to study antisocial personality disorder. It's not, these are not the, the easiest subject to study, just by definition. <laughs> My hypothesis, some of these subjects are actually really good at reading the minds of others. So my hypothesis is that they can use their mirror neurons to understand the intentions of others, but they, they do not get the emotional consequence. And so remember my graph in which there is the mirror neuron area, the insula, and then the emotional brain centers. It's possible that the insula forms some kind of a, um, uh, decouples the activity between the mirror neuron areas and the emotional brain centers. Thank you. Uh, so you studied the activation levels of the mirror neurons. How much of it is fixed and how much can you kind of change with uh, how much of it is wired in and how much can you change? That's another great question. Well, the good news is that when I, when I went to med school, the idea was that the brain is not so much plastic. You can only lose cells in the brain, which would be really bad news for somebody like me. But it turns out that even in late age, you can, there is now evidence that there is new cell formation. And certainly there is evidence that this system can learn. So you can actually change the properties of the system. There are nice studies that show that you tend to have a much faster uh, imitation when you, uh, when you uh, make an action, I mean, a much faster res model response when you make an action while you see the same action. But suppose I train you for about 30 minutes and in opening your um, hand while you see me closing my hand, in about 30 minutes, you overcome the difference. You are as efficient uh, to open your hand when you see hand opening as when you see hand closing. So the system really learns uh, quickly. And so you can actually change the properties of the system. So you mentioned uh, autism where sort of the mirror neur neurons don't activate uh, enough. Now, I read an interview with one of the people from the Palmer lab uh, described uh, th an illness called echopraxia where it seems like it activates too much. Can you talk a little bit about that? I hope the journalists didn't make that up. 
Right. Well, I think that's you know a classical dysfunction of imitative behavior. Echopraxy is really so um, it's not useful at all. Uh, so what can happen here? I think that we are going to have to change the way we think about the mirror neuron system. It's not just a one-layer system. Uh, there are at least two layers, I would say. One, the classical mirror neurons that uh, uh, so far are the protagonists of most of my work. But now we have evidence in humans that there are some cells that I call super mirrors that seem to have more flexible properties. And they seem to be able to actually inhibit the activity of these classical mirror neuron areas. So it is possible, in this case, the um, communication between these two layers um, is uh, not working properly. And so some of these patients actually have this hyper imitative behavior. Well, and I think we have um, time for one final question. Mike? Um, I, I'd like to ask you about some of the social consequences of what you were saying about how, um, like, there, there's some people, I guess, who have uh, less of an ability to, um, like, like, do the mirror actions. Does that mean that, like, they'll have less of a capacity for, like, empathy? And is, is like, can you, can you teach that? Can you train people to be empathetic? or sympathetic to other people, or is that something that you're just like born with somehow? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, we briefly touched on this. I think that both the interventions in children with autism that seems to be effective, and the fact that it, we have uh, um, evidence that you can learn quickly, um, it tells us that you can actually teach people. And so that's, in fact, one of the really uh, nice property of this system, and also uh, the nice optimistic message that you can actually um, send around, that, in fact, you can even train people to be more empathic. I have some time after the, after the talk if you have any further questions. So we wanted to thank you again for, for coming. It was a very great talk.